Hey folks, welcome to the Modern Agile Show, episode 46. I'm here with my friend Stephen Perry in the UK, and Stephen is uh, a friend. He's the director, a managing director of the Sense and Adapt Academy, um, which is very exciting. We're going to be talking about that. And uh, he and I have worked together. I think we first met in Europe at some conferences there. Uh, welcome to the show, Stephen. It's great to see you, and it's great to be here. Well, um, we have a, quite a bit to talk about. Um, I think this is going to proceed in like three parts. We've discussed, you know, all the exciting things. Mm -hmm. um, you started. You told me a story. I think in a bar in Warsaw, <laughs> um, okay. which I found just absolutely incredible. And um, I, I thought, let's just start the show with that story. Cause it, it truly, I think it, it exemplifies you and what you go are going for. So can you tell us the story of um, Fujitsu and the airline company? Yes, um, and it's interesting that you picked that one out, and I've still got the photographs of that time in the bar in Warsaw as well, so I could send this out to you. Um, <laughs> the Fujitsu story um, in relating to um, the airline company um, is, is interesting because uh, Fujitsu at the time were not in outsourcing of technology or um, uh, business process or anything like that. Fujitsu are very much known for um, uh, air conditioners and things like that and um, some high-end servers but um, Fujitsu recognized early on and we're talking about the year 2000 2001 um, that they needed to move into services otherwise they wouldn't have a business and I was brought in at that time to think about how we could catch up with the other providers during that time so that's a bit of context but I, to get to the point of your story and um, to illustrate how we had to think about competing very differently. We had to say, well, the, the, the whole outsourcing movement is predictably on how much um, service you get, how, much, um, how many servers you've got, how many breakdowns, how many incidents, all the usual stuff that has been around for 30 years, even in 2000. And I said, look, we, we really need to just change the way that we are looking at this. Customers are not buying IT, they're buying what they do with it. All right, it's like that old story. They're buying, why do they buy a drill? They're not buying a drill, they're buying holes in the wall. So how does that relate to us? And this came to, to light. They said, we can, we can do this. We can just not deliver to the specification. We can define what the specification is from a business perspective, not an IT perspective. What other business outcomes this airline wants? All right, um, because we have to be very different. Yes. And so we, we put a, we did lots of tests and we felt confident that we could do this. And I was part of the bid team mm -hmm. that, that spoke to the, um, the chief technical officer and the CIO of this airline company. And I, I remember quite early on, they came into um, the room after showing them around uh, Fujitsu and um, they then set about the early stages of, so what can you do for us? And they said, look, here's our specification about the contract. This is the sort of thing we want. We want in our help desk, first time fix of this. We want delivery times of that. Um, and we want replenishment times of technology. So all the usual stuff and the usual measurements of how we did against that. This was to help run said, their, this was to, sorry to interrupt, but this was to help basically, I mean, they, did they have a, an existing system in place that wasn't functioning too well? Um, I mean, it is an airline, so. Yes, it's an airline. And what they said is, look, um, we're up against all the low cost airlines mm. and we have to strip out the cost of managing our IT. I see. Um, it, it, it's all legacy mm -hmm. um, and we want to change our operating model. So that's why they were coming to some partners to help them. So sure, sure. that was the bigger context. But they were looking for the traditional stuff that everybody else gives them. And they were asking what they wanted, and here's the specification, and they said, you should be asking for what you need. 
And they said, this is what you need. And I said, so this, how does this help the flying passenger? Well, we can keep our costs down, all right, just like everybody else. So it's not going to be a differentiator. It's going to be a me too. And they said, yes, that's what we're competing on. So to, to cut a long story short, some of the measures, some of the things were something like, we want your help desk people, a, a great technical help desk people, and we've seen that, but we want to contra contract around a first time fix of 70%. So I'm sitting there now with the other guys from Fujitsu and they're looking at me sort of smiling because they knew what was coming next. I said, so why do you want 70%? And he looked at me, I said, why didn't you ask for 90%, 100% or 60%? And the airline guys were looking at each other a bit bemused by this question. I said, why that number? And he said, well, a consultant told us that what we, that's what we should expect from the best. I said, look, I, the problem is this. I said, we can do that, and so can everybody else. All right? They can fix all these problems and charge you for doing it. We want to not fix those problems at all. And he looked at me, and he said, what do you mean? He said, I said, you shouldn't even be having those problems. Okay, yeah. That is a failure, complete failure of, of service. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that doesn't compete. You're just doing what you did before with cheaper, neater, faster waste disposal contracts. Mm -hmm. And, and I, that's nonsense. So we then said, look, we want to acquire your business objectives. What are your business objectives? And they said things like, um, well, our, our queues of check-in are really, really, really long. And there are certain types of technology which doesn't seem fit for purpose and a whole list of things, and aircraft are not to, um, able to take off on time, and things like that. And we said, right, we'll contract around that. And he said, how can you do that? Yes. I said, because that's what you want. Mm -hmm. And then when we did some work, we then found a whole host of things that the business was not doing. And they were in a, an alliance with a number of other companies um, that they wanted to share best practice. And a lot of the big airlines were in this, this, this thing, um, this conglomerate, if you like, and sharing um, the support across different suppliers. But we were offering something completely different and they didn't believe we could do this. So we did some very simple analysis. Okay, and we said, this is the number of slots that you missed out of Heathrow last week. Oh yeah. These are the number of passengers that didn't meet your alliance with your other airlines because you didn't know they were coming in. This aircraft, these aircrafts were delayed because your email system was so slow and broken that you couldn't order the parts in time to fix the aircraft to turn around. Yeah. All right. And now, now and you were, but before you got to these conversations, you had to win the contract, right? No, we hadn't got the contract. At this oh, point. you still didn't have the contract. So you, they no. gave you an opportunity to really analyze it from a business perspective rather than the IT perspective. Yes. And because we had other airlines. We were working with other airlines and we'd worked out what their purpose was and the purpose we'd figured out that what an airline that's outsourcing their IT infrastructure wants us to do is to help them get their passengers safely from A to B and right. to keep the aircraft in the sky for as long as possible and to help get better shift patterns for their crews because the technology wasn't communicating. So it was all about, it wasn't the cost of service, all right? It was the cost of the failure to ask for the right thing. Yes, beautiful. Because looking at the cost of the service mm -hmm. instead of looking at the cost to their business and their passengers. Mm -hmm. So you do things like, okay, so now a goal on, what did they say? Um, Passengers queuing up, this was before we did all this online stuff, at the check-ins, right, okay. So how many people, when was this happening? And, and we, could, we could find this stuff out. So then what we said is, okay, we got all these IT failures. The normal thing that uh, the traditional outsourcer would do is saying, what's the cost of failure here? Or oh, these printers, Hewlett Packard, whatever it is, well, Hewlett Packard's an okay company, but this printer wasn't, okay. This got the most um, 
these are the worst time between failures. It breaks down more often. Um, and we should change these out and get the customer to, to purchase them. And we recommend those come out. And it was by the product, the IT product. But we were capturing what I call customer intelligence and business intelligence and adding that to the work, as well as the technical work. So in effect, in effect it was the context. It was the business context that we were evaluating. So we wouldn't say, okay, is this a critical, high criticality um, system? And they work out, oh, it's on the number of people affected. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, if it's a server that's down, then there must be lots of people. If there are one or two people, then they can wait. And then we calculated how many one or two people there were and compared uh, that's the client's um, user base and, and employees. We counted out how many single users had a problem and how many people had a problem in total because of the server. And it was the single user had five times more people suffering the problem as individual users than the servers. But all the mentality was saying, that's what we want to do because there's bound to be. So that put all these other people at the back of the queue and their service was pri low priority. So their perception of their supplier previously was the vast majority of people who experienced the service was that their supplier was crap. Okay. Interesting. And so it, they would, prioritization is a symptom of the disease you're trying to cure. It, it's nuts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. This, this was really about what the business of flying aircraft, replenishing aircraft, getting them from one destination to another, making sure that there's food there, making sure that the bookings are done, making sure that the, cast, the customers meet their alliance with the other uh, customers. So we were looking at, instead of mean time to between failure, this is the crown jewels. We just put the context on the call, which says, queue a check-in 90 deep, all right? And all the problems from a business side, not the priority, what the business problem was. And then when traditional organizations run a report on what to fix, they look at what's costing me the most money, this Hewlett Packard printer, we'll persuade the customer to take that out. But if you put that in context of the business, that was not the problem. So we then sorted our data, which is dead easy to do by the context. And then we run our report said, Give me all the IT um, and application failures related to check-in. Give me all the failures related to uh, lost luggage. Give me, uh, and a completely different list comes out. Yes, yes. So, so that's... now what we do, okay, so now we are delivering, not only solving the IT problem, but we are using the business knowledge mm -hmm. to decide what it is, not the one that yeah. is the cheapest for us to get out or the most expensive for us to serve. So the cost to serve. your competitors um, were, I mean, very large companies, I believe, right? Uh, the IBMs, the, the compact, yes. uh, other, other yes. large companies that are accustomed to yes. doing a lot of outsourced contracts. Yes. And they were not telling uh, this airline that, um, you know, you're asking for the wrong thing. No, they weren't, they weren't even aware of it. They weren't even aware to ask for that. Okay. Um, you want to take a time out? No, I just wanted to make sure that uh, I got some message from Zoom, so I just want to make sure it's still it's still good here. Um, I got your recording here. It, it's still, it's still recording. Good. Okay. Great. Um, so. You're you you basically present a completely different you know. Um, suggestion to this airline yes. you still haven't won the contract but they've given you at least enough access to to explore the business need the real business need yes. and not not just listen to what their requirements were asking and mm -hmm. and say we'll do that for you but just actually approach it from a completely different perspective now yes. did you win the contract did Fujitsu win we it ten, for 10 years we did. <laughs> a 10, ten year years contract and it knocked out the competition because nobody else did it. And we won so many contracts 
that there was no competition. One of the biggest ones that we won uh, was in, in Asia. This was Microsoft at that time. Um, we had bid in another contract um, and we lost. We found out later that they weren't asking for what we were providing, but they wanted a, a competent supplier to lower the price as a pressure point on the existing provider. So that, that, was, that was the game. And they said, but what you do is quite extraordinary and you've proved that you could do it because I went down to Australia to get them to do it down there. And some of those stories are, are really great. We haven't got time for that. But yeah. the upshot from a business perspective is when these 10 countries across Asia were then looking at, we need to support our infrastructure. They're into buildings, um, um, Microsoft infrastructures and applications and things like that. But the, you know, the big networks and all those other things, they wanted some support on. And they wanted that to go out to tender. It came to us, but it was not a competitive tender. It was just us because they'd seen what we did before. I see. So they already, yeah. And, and yeah. now, did this, so I, I forgot to, I apologize, I forgot to mention earlier that you're the author of Sense and Respond, um, yes. a book that uh, came out in the early 2000s, I think, 2000 and 2005. After we won all of these awards and things like that, and I decided yeah. this is a very different perspective. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it's incumbent upon me at this point to say where some of those perspectives come from, because I don't do those on my own. I have luckily access to some really br brilliant people in industry and, and, and ideas. And the lean movement um, and pur purveyors of the lean movement were very influential. But I had got that slightly wrong, all right? Because most purveyors of lean were talking about leaning the inside of the organization, leaning my production system. And look, I said, we know how to do that. What we don't know how to do is to lean the customer's environment and their business, because that is outside our business. And that was the main shift from lean in manufacturing to lean in services. You're leaning the outside world, and mm. therefore you need to understand it. Yes. And then when Womack and Jones came along with this, they said, we didn't see this. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, so that led to this whole thing about the consumption cycle, which was a sort of abbreviation of what I was, I was interested in. But I was looking at setting up businesses and creating a business and contract, which is way beyond setting up your work processes internally, externally, is how do I capitalize the pants off the competition? Yeah. And that's my motto. That's what Sense and Respond is about. Sense and Adapt is how can I adapt to beat the pants off the competition. Mm -hmm. And that's business strategy. It's right. organizational design. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's finding different ways to continually change. Yes. And, you know, continual change, changing the way you change is the most important thing about adaptiveness. Mm. And I think that's really where the agile business agility movement is, is trying to get, but it's using the language of the agile community, and they're trying to get the business community to talk like them and understand. And at a conference the other day, I said, I'm waving my arms about it, I always get excited. <laughs> um, and I said, you're looking at it through the wrong end of the telescope. Okay, it, you have to learn business. Mm. You have to learn the language of business mm -hmm. and you have to turn it into something that you're going to compete with. Yeah. You can't create what you do to create a me too. Why do you expect people to invest large amount of money in a transformation to have exactly what everybody else is having? That is bonkers. But you have the whole of these large movements on the bandwagon to give everybody what everybody else has got. And then you'll get what everybody else has got and you're back to square one. Nobody's learned. And you're using all this new approach to do your old approach better. And you end up half the time with cheaper need to raise. Yeah, so um, that, that's, uh, I think when, 
so I think ultimately, if I, if I can try to paraphrase, you are very, very, very focused on the customer in your work. That is, with the organizations you're, you're, you're collaborating with, you're getting yeah. their, them to focus back on the essence of their business, which is, of yeah. course, uh, I mean, one, one part of it, of course, is a big part of it is, is the customer's experience excellent. So whether it's the yeah. airline or it's, it's users, users of Microsoft products or other companies, is the, comp- is the customer's experience excellent? And what is getting in the way of that? That's, that's the bit, what the business is there for. Uh, of course, the business is also there to help make sure the employees have a, you know, a, a, a delightful time at work or enjoyable time at work. Right? If, you have, if you have miserable pilots, but happy customers, you're going to have a problem at some point. Yeah. So yeah. It's, this is where in Modern Agile, we call it make people awesome. Yeah. That is our North Star. That is what we're saying is the most important thing. Um, yes. And I, I think that harmonizes with your message, if I, if, if I can yes. say that. Okay. Yeah, I must mention one other person that had a hand in that because he was very focused on removing waste coming out of the lean movement. And, and he was saying all of this waste should be taken out and, and fair enough. Um, and that was a guy called John Seddon and I learned a lot from him. But what he was focusing on is again, the optimization of removing waste so you're left with value. And that's fine. But I wanted to go further than that and create completely different forms of value. So this was how are we having conversations with businesses about the value they create for their business and their customers. And there are two, there are two basic approaches that are fighting here. You have what I call the make and sell industrial model which is my sense response stuff was consumed into that. So it's essentially, no, you need to transform your whole way out of this. Instead of doing your old stuff better with new methods, you need to change what you're changing completely. And that industrial model, I call it, is is a make and sell. This is the product, we now need to sell it, okay? And it's it's an economic model that's taught in universities, which is, the law of supply and demand, okay? We make the supply, we've got that, now we need to generate the demand most of the time. And then they're forcing people to do that in the cheapest, neatest, fastest way. Whereas sense and respond, sense and adapt organization, let me go back to the industrial organizations, they define themselves by the products and services they make from their list and they push it. Lean organizations and sense and adapt organizations define themselves not by the products and services, but the value they create, leaving them free to experiment with any other product or service. And just that mindset is a complete unlocking. Moving from an organization that's industrial where everything is forbidden unless I tell you, says the manager, Whereas in the sense and adapt, the manager says, everything you can touch, all right? You're not forbidden. You have the freedom to touch, except this bit. You're forbidden to touch this, which is the SOX compliance or something else, okay? Because there are some legal implications. But with everything else, you can use this intelligence, the knowledge from outside, giving the designing better jobs for people with the right level of authority and creating a system where they collaborate end to end Mm -hmm. naturally and top to bottom. Right. This is okay. So this is a great segue into, we worked together uh, last year um, for a very large company and uh, where, you know, the end to end can take years uh, yeah. to get the product out the door many years. It's, it's, it's in the scientific realm. Um, lots and lots and lots of people involved. Um, very large financial bets placed on, on this product. Um, you know, so they don't have that environment. They don't have it at all. What, could, uh, what can we take from that? What, what did they need that they weren't applying? Um, 
let me just get into that gently because there, there, there are a number of steps. But, but my first memory and takeaway was not about them. It was people in our industry talk about we have a scientific approach until you meet real scientists <laughs> and then you realize you don't. All right? <laughs> what we have is a trial and error approach, okay, mm. which is evolutionary in its sense. Mm. Try it and try it, okay, which is past iteration, past clock rates. But these were real scientists, and when they wanted evidence, they mean evidence. And, uh, and your claims, if you're making these extraordinary claims for things, they were looking for extraordinary evidence to support it. So that was, so you have to understand the nature of these people. These are highly intelligent, highly specialized in these highly technical areas. And suddenly you wanted a lot of collaboration with these people where they have had deep, deep scientific disciplines and, and how do we get around that? And they'd sunk into specialisms of this expertise and they could only work with the groups they were in and collaborate with the groups they were in because it was highly technical and scientific. And to try and shift that into an end-to-end -end perspective was, was one of the jobs that, that you were tasked to do to reduce the time it takes to get new products to market for these highly sophisticated products. And they were really, it was an inspirational company in many ways, but it didn't, didn't know how to change rapidly because it was an old industry. Yes, the technologies had changed, but basically the understanding of how you produce what they did was basically the same. And people had come to expect that's how long it takes to get this from certain countries, you know, trying to get licenses for this, that, and the other to operate on the packaging and all that. It was assumed. And that was a group of people that did that, that had nothing to do with what they were creating. So these, so the intention was great, but I think they shifted too quickly to just saying, we'll have cross-functional teams and they didn't know how to work together. And the expectation on you and your guys was extremely high because they were, they were seeing the success you had at other places. Why can't we have that? And there were some fundamental foundational reasons why that was. And, and one was it was a climate very much of of merit and excellence, and you got promoted on that. So it was very much an internal competitive situation rather than collaborative. And that was true of the industry, not just this particular client. So I'm painting a picture of what this climate was like. And you came in at a time when it already embarked on this program and he was getting into trouble. And then you would say, well, maybe you can do this, maybe you could do that, experiment. But they wanted it fast, okay? They didn't even take their own medicine of exploring and experimenting. Right. They expected you to come in and just do it. And that, that was a real, it's a culture shift. It's, it's mm -hmm. the mind shift, yep. Yep. the skill shift. Mm -hmm. And it's a shift in, how you operate the business. There's three shifts. Yeah, that's, that's extremely difficult to make that change. And they, I think, you know, you said it earlier in the show, change the way we change. Yes. How can we get organizations to change the way they change? Um, yes. They were not used to change. In fact, mm -hmm. any industry I've ever worked with where um, it's highly profitable does not have much incentive to change. You know, mm -hmm. um, we, we can give a final report to a customer and say, listen, you know, um, yeah, you're struggling to make this change happen. We're helping as best we can, but every time we try something, um, we're, we're being uh, impeded um, by the organization itself, by the, by the climate, the work climate, as you would say. Yeah. Um, we can give a bad report card. And, and then it, at times we've, we've heard the client say, yes, all of that's true. We acknowledge this. And we had our best year ever profit-wise, and we're all getting gigantic bonuses. <laughs> and so it's like, what's the, so, you know, 
the incentive to change often isn't there if, if they're not aware of, let's say, future competitors who are nipping at their heels. And then they, they, they do exist right, for this particular customer. They knew about them. They knew that they were losing their edge uh, in terms of being a pioneer of, of being first to market with new kinds of products that, um, you know, helped people in the world. Um, they knew that, yet I don't know if the, that the collective um, need, the collective, uh, you know, urge to change really existed maybe in a few people's minds, but not in the vast majority. So if that doesn't exist, and, and you know, I mean, this, this gets us, I think, into, um, you have a fascinating difference between, you know, improvement and transformation. Perhaps yeah. they were just interested in improvement. Can you speak about the difference there? Yes. Um, there's nothing wrong with improvement and there's nothing wrong with transformation. Um, but let's call it the change personality. All right. The organizations that have a particular style in the way they change. It keeps them safe, it keeps them comfortable, and all that. And by the way, it keeps the organization in stasis. So that before engaging on any sort, embarking on any change, you have to understand the change community in those. Who does the change? How do they do that? Okay? And how are management reassured by that? Okay? It's the usual stuff. They have a change personality very much on the make and sell which is gun charts, security, you know the path from A to B, all right? But that, to change that to something like agile, um, large-scale lean, it is that approach to change you have to sidle up with and wean them away from that until they feel comfortable. But then you lose speed. But if you don't do that, you lose the program. Okay. Yes. And, and that's, that's the education because um, I, I call the adaptive organization is, is a flywheel. There are parts in the flywheel, but the metaphor goes like this. It, it, it's hard to change the direction of this flywheel. And sometimes this flywheel is rusted up after so long. And when you look at a flywheel, there are two points of resistance. One is around the axle. And that is the work level. And they were trying, others were trying to get the work level work on that axle greased. And then they were still not getting the momentum. Why? Because on the outside, somebody had decided we need to put the brakes on. So it doesn't matter how much work you do in the middle, it never breaks through because you're not shifting the corporate flywheel for change. Mm -hmm. So you have to take the brakes off. You don't have to accelerate by putting more gas in. You need to find where the brakes are on and just take them off. And you get the people that are doing this work here able to put energy into this flywheel and to get it moving rather than just get more heat and more noise around the axle. Yes. And, and, and this is how I see business agility. They're trying to take what they do around the axle at daily work, and those are different methods and approaches. There are different purposes there to what the purpose is at the top. Mm -hmm. And you've got to, to get the flywheel going, to get that inertia is you've got to work on how you design, build, and operate your business, and how you um, get the work done. So coming back to what you, you're talking about is they wanted improvement on how the work was done. And then we get freed up. Okay. So they were looking for incremental improvements. And yes, you could. So you inch this heavy flywheel. And then a couple of weeks it stopped. Yeah, well, this stuff doesn't work, does it? And they blame. All right. But this required a complete transformation in their thinking and the way they design, build, and operate their organization and the controls that they put around it. Improvement is not to be sneezed at, but we require transformation today. And transformation, if you just look at the word transformation, it's a two, it literally means going beyond trans, your current form, your formation. 
and people are, 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 are seeing and confusing work level stuff as transformative of the business and it is not. Right. It's the just... rest of the organization is still putting the brakes on. Mm -hmm. They have not had the mind shift, right. the skill shift, or the shift in the purpose of their business. Mm -hmm. yep. So it's important to tell, come, come down to what are we trying to do in the marketplace? Mm -hmm. What do we want? What competitive basis do we want to be absolutely clear? But yeah. we're not. If you could get the people down the bottom to speed things up, put them together and magic stuff happens, not realizing that you've got the break on. So more companies, yeah, uh, basically, I mean, this is, I think this is incredible because it, being really clear with um, an organization, are you interested in improvement or are you, are, are you interested in transformation, you know, yes. going beyond your existing form? Yes. That's a fundamentally different thing. And people just use the word transformation very loosely, I think, as you're, as you, as you're saying, but when they really do mean just making improvements. Yes. Um, you know, Jeffrey Moore, you know, in, in, in the, uh, the chain, you know, the, the, the cost was, sorry, Jeffrey Moore's incredible um, curve, which, which shows the, yes. you know, movement from a, a pioneer to ultimately the late majority yes. um, adopting it. I mean, yes. when we look at the early and late majorities, they are um they're not interested in a revolution they're usually not they're interested in tiny little improvements to existing they don't want to upset the existing environment they just want to improve it a little bit i mean so to me though the early and late majority who are not pioneering not interested in, in real transformation they're interested in improvement um and and so and that's fine if your competitive basis requires just that then don't go to the expense of look if you're in a business if you're in a business and there's going to be demand for your product all the time and you're not under competitive pressure and you have um, an industrial mass production type approach and as long as you're decent to people all right that you're not doing bad things and exploiting them then that's fine yeah, yeah. It's about creating wealth. But if, if your market is rapidly changing, you're being continually disruptive, and then you have to catch up by copying somebody else's disruption, by which time they, they're onto something else and you're left behind. Yeah. So adaptiveness is about having a workforce that can create disruption mm -hmm. and respond to disruption from other people and go above that. Yeah. So you, you advocate for having the workers be very closely in touch with the organizational uh, outcomes and, the, and what the organization stands for, what it really is there to, to do, rather than yes. there being a separation between leadership and management knowing that stuff and workers just being worker bees doing what they're told. You're talking yeah. about creating the, the kind of work environment in which everyone understands what kind of company it is and, and the disruptive nature yeah. becomes becomes part of the culture because they're yeah. constant they're aware every worker is aware of how critical it is to you know win in the marketplace and, and to make extremely happy customers uh, and that 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 comes out of a competitive atmosphere right it's not just every yeah. company needs this no. it's part of a competitive atmosphere yeah yes and you're reminding me of um I think an important story that manifests what you said about who's involved in this change. There's a very large um, global enterprise software company, I, I won't mention the name, um, but they were getting into the cloud business very late and they needed to have a different model and a different way of working. And so they, they approached me and they said, we need to jump a generation of things. Otherwise, we're going to lose a lot of our business. We're going to lose market share. So they were very late coming to that. So they gave me a bunch of 26 people from around the world, different um, types of jobs, all levels. And my job was to just to shift their thinking and their perspective of what they were in existence for. Because they saw themselves as producing enterprise technologies. Uh -huh. Now, 
I said, so what does that mean for your customer? What does it mean for your employee? And what does it mean for your business? Yeah. And I created this three purpose thing and then come up with what is the common purpose from all of those. But to cut a long story short, which is the nub of this, these guys within three months had diagnosed the key points that were causing the friction, both at the work level and in the organization. Doesn't take them long when they know what they're looking for. You've reminded them. They now get in the skill set. They now repurposing the business. That, that's, that's what's going on. So they're looking at the business from a very different perspective. They're acquiring a different skill set and they're getting knowledge. They redesigned the outline of the new organization. They also redesigned the vice president level's jobs. Wow. <laughs> so six months later, now having gone through this, these were the prototypes. This is what we wanted to test. Mm -hmm. It was a system, what I call a thinking system organization. Beautiful, beautiful. And what that meant was there were all these components to this that we were going to test them to destruction. Mm -hmm. And then we were going to see how these things fitted. Okay. And that, that took another just about 18 months. All right. And we, we tested it. We'd implemented sections of this and we were, we went, we were literally transforming as we were learning. But the key that made this happen was that they designed, the, you design the work, you design the teams to help do the work. Because in all businesses, the work is pretty much the same. You design the teams around the work and then you design the management around the teams. But that's not the way most, man, what most organizations do it. They design the management scopes. Then they decide which bits of work they'd like to look after. Then right. they go and horse trade between everybody to bring them into their team. Mm -hmm. You do the transformation and your business falls flat on it. <laughs> okay. So maybe this is a nice segue. Uh, we should probably uh, finish the show here uh, with, with a little bit on what is this new thing you've created, the, uh, the Sense and Adapt Academy. What is that? Uh, in response to being exposed to some of the work that, that you have been doing um, and working with some of your clients. It's this problem, this perennial problem of they're looking at the new stuff that you're doing through the old lens, trying to solve the old problems. That is the issue. So they're interpreting what you're doing in the old way and they don't even see what the real problems are. So you have to have that shift. And that's why the first part of sense and adapt is you need to sense. Okay. People go in and ask me, so what's your solution? I said, look, there's a reason it's called sense and adapt. Let's do the sensing first and figure it out. Okay. So, so sensing. And so, so the, the academy is, is designed to help teach people this art. It is an art. Um, and, and it's, and I would go so, so far as to say it's training, it's accelerating wisdom in individuals. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> so I'm not teaching a method. I'm, I'm teaching a way to engage with the world that gives you the best chance of making sense of it and the best chance of finding solutions that you haven't even thought about. To get to real transformation, to actually create an environment Absolutely. in which transformation is yes. is the normal way. Yeah. Absolutely. And, okay. and who and would sorry. a capability in an organization? Yeah, and who who uh, who who are the what's the target audience for the academy, for example? The target audience for the academy are business people that have heard all these great stories about agile at a business level and they're not seeing it right. and they say don't bring that stuff here mm -hmm. don't even mention it right all right right so it's for the business people who want to achieve business outcomes now i i don't do improvement because there's loads of people can do that mm -hmm. if you want transformation mm -hmm. then i am the man right right got it okay. got it and, and this this method is about on what basis do i need to compete so this mm -hmm. is a strategic competitive 
conversation that then says, okay, what does that mean for my operating model? What does that mean for my capabilities? So yes. that's a management yes. level. And then processing and being innovative at work and coming back from the, the work, workers, if you like, with all that information about the business much before the, the marketing focus groups have found out. Mm -hmm. All your people have told you what your customers really want. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. And you bring this together, mm -hmm. okay? And I see what I'm producing is thinking instruments. Mm -hmm. So whatever the complex situation is, you can have a fair stab at having a go at this from different angles, but that's the key. Mm -hmm. You're not using this one with this one and trying to come up with a, like the worst of all possible worlds, Lean Sigma, all right? You're looking at the problem from a business perspective. You all are. It doesn't matter where you're in the organization. Right, right, right. Yeah, love that, love that. It, it, you know, that, that theme comes up a lot in my interviews in this show in terms of how critical it is for workers, staff of an organization to be really in touch with, uh, you know, what the company, what the organization stands for, what they're trying to achieve. Uh, you know, even even um, uh, being aware of the finances of the company. Right, so that yeah. they're not they're not they're not protected from that. They're actually quite aware of yes. the finances of the competitors of the environment they're they're yes. competing in. Let's say so they, that they can come up with innovative ideas, and 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 that you're not shielding workers from customers. In fact, yes. just the opposite. You're helping yes. them to be much more in touch with them. I mean, in these giant organizations, like the one we worked in recently there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who ultimately get involved in building a product. So none of this is easy. Um, so I think, you know, what you're, what you're talking about is, is really important for companies that want to like transform in the 21st century. Yes. Uh, they're, they're not going to, they're not going to survive if they continue on the path that they've set that might've gotten them to where they are, but, but yes. clearly they need to shift. And, uh, you know, I think, so where do people find out about the, the Sense and Adapt Academy? Um, it's on my website, and okay. uh, um, lloydparry.com. Got it. Um, that is going to be changed very soon to Sense and Adapt, but that's where it is at the moment. If you go into lloydparry.com and go under the section drop down under education, there's a whole page on the Sense and Adapt Academy. How, how it's um, its intention and the different types of wisdom that people at different levels of the organizations need to acquire. So it's a, being a, um, a change maker to the top of the organization is, is a very different approach and language to being talking to a middle manager. And that's what I teach these change makers to do is to engage on the terms and the language that other people use, not get them to use sense and adapt language, yeah. lean, agile language. Right. No, they are good at what they do, mm -hmm. but you need these catalysts to bring these together so you've got a new common language. Mm -hmm. And more often, it becomes your own language. All right? It is not, and you become competitive doing different things, yet it's the same thinking instruments that gives rise to very different forms of competitiveness. Yeah. You don't take what I take and then repeat this for the same for everybody else, which is right. the other right. methods of doing it. Right. No, if, if they're competing on that basis like that, and it might be a company that I brought, they brought new products and services to market that are differentiating them. Mm -hmm. I can list them, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, yeah, and my original truly... concept was, you know, rather than talk about sense and respond and sense and adapt, like, a, a bit like Intel badge. If you remember that, it's just like sense and respond inside. <laughs> right. <laughs> Intel inside. Right, yeah. right. Wisdom. All these uh, different things. Yeah, right. It's, it's, uh, it's very refreshing to hear all this stuff. And uh, I think it it's, reminds us that with all the years and decades that have passed in terms of you know, attempting to make improvements to help companies improve, Ultimately, we have still a long way to go in terms of mm -hmm. uh, creating an environment in which everyone has this kind of wisdom inside, as you're saying, and, and, and can really yes. help to 
to transform the organization to to be continually competitive and continually delightful mm -hmm. to their customers. Yeah. Um, that's still businesses, hard. Businesses are slow to do that, but we do have an ally. There's a couple of allies. One is the workforces will no longer be command and controlled anymore. They are right. part of the decision making. And anybody who doesn't believe that, they can work out on the diary when they're going to go bust. Okay. And, and the, the other thing is the, the rate of competition and innovations between technologies, workplaces, even world cultures at the moment demand that you're able to change in a different way and rapidly. Mm -hmm. So that's on our side. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, Stephen. I really uh, love chatting with you and you're just a um, wonderful individual fountain of wisdom and uh, I, I'm truly honored that you took some time to to talk with me today. Um, if you enjoyed this show, please share it, like our YouTube channel and uh, thank you for watching. Stephen, thanks for being on the show. Okay, it's been a pleasure and keep up the good work because you're one of those pioneers. Thank you. Thank Learned you. Learned a lot from you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Stephen. Stephen.